The gun violence crisis on rapid fire. <laughs> Devices that can empty clips in the blink of an eye and put bystanders at greater risk. It makes it very hard to control the weapon. How these illegal modifications are making their way into our communities at a growing rate. Then, the long-awaited break in a cold case murder. It took a long time, but we did it. Yeah. A Boeing worker brutally killed in her own home. I just wanted to pick up the phone and call my dad. I just wanted to say, Dad, we got him, we got him. How Kent police unraveled the case in a cross-country search for clues, now in the spotlight. The Spotlight brought to you by Beacon Plumbing. It's a Lego-sized device that turns a handgun into a machine gun, spraying bullets everywhere. Good evening and welcome to The Spotlight. I'm David Rose. Seattle police say they've seen an increase in the number of shootings with as many as 70, 80, even 90 rounds fired because criminals modified their guns with Glock switches. Because of that recoil, they cannot control the weapon. It's very, very dangerous. It makes it much less likely that those suspects will hit what they're aiming at, but sadly makes it much more likely that they're gonna hit a bystander or innocents or folks that have nothing to do with the incident that's going on. Investigators say it is far too easy for criminals to get their hands on these add-ons from the dark corners of the internet. The Spotlight's AJ Janabel talked with the ATF about these deadly modifications. Lay on the ground now. Lay, don't grab the gun. A teenager accused of robbing strangers in Seattle. A 20-year-old accused of shooting up a car over a road rage incident in Linwood. Do you have anything on you? Any weapons? I got a weapon on me. And a 21-year-old accused of fleeing from deputies after a traffic stop in Spanaway. Three counties, three incidents, all involving dangerously modified handguns. What we call a Glock switch on the back of that firearm. What that does is it makes it a fully automatic weapon at that point. With an extended clip like this, a suspect can fire off 20 plus rounds in a second with a Glock switch. An auto seer does the same thing for rifles, and federal investigators tell me it's a big concern. Law enforcement is recovering these Glock switches at an increasing rate, uh, you know, day by day, year by year. Special agent in charge, Jonathan Blaze, with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms says, these guns are being used in dangerous and deadly crimes. <laughs> Investigators say the suspects are getting younger and younger. Suspects, get down! In late July, Seattle police arrested two 14-year-olds and a 13-year-old who, video shows, were in possession of a modified, fully automatic handgun. Right here. Oh, there you go. These modified guns are completely illegal unless you get a federal license and registration. But that's not slowing down criminals from getting their hands on them. It's dangerous out there right now uh, with these individuals possessing these devices and they can easily find these devices anywhere uh, on the internet, through sources, they're being made overseas and imported. Uh, they're being made here locally with the prevalence of 3D printing. With so many ways to access these dangerous devices, Blaze says it makes it a challenge for law enforcement to crack down on this technology. For the Spotlight, I'm AJ Janivel. Those Glock switches and auto sears are considered violations of the machine gun ban, punishable by up to 10 years in federal prison. But well, tonight, Bellevue police are asking for your help to identify this bank robber. He terrified the teller. The surveillance video is from the Wells Fargo by the Crossroads Shopping Center back on July 17th. Police say a young man in his 20s or 30s passed the teller a note that read, this is a robbery. Bellevue PD Captain Joe Nault says he demanded large bills and then took off with the cash. That bank teller could have been any of our friends or relatives. And when all you're doing is going to work every day and doing your job, you want to feel safe. And when somebody comes in and shatters that security bubble that you have, it changes you. And so that person, whether they showed a gun or not, did a lot of harm to that, to that bank teller, to her coworkers, and to this community. Now, take a good look at this woman. Bellevue police say she's a second person of interest. She was seen with the suspect before and after the robbery. Get this. Police say she went shoplifting at a nearby store while he held up the bank. If you have any information on their identity or location, Crime Stoppers of Puget Sound will pay you a cash reward of up to $1,000. Call 1-800-222-TIPS or use the P3TIPS app 
on your cell phone. Well, if you don't know those suspects, maybe this guy looks familiar. He is one shady character with a taste for designer sunglasses. According to Linwood Police, this man has been hitting the sunglass hut hard in recent weeks. He's not only stolen from the store in the Alderwood Mall, Redmond Police also have two cases on this suspect. Police believe he's responsible for taking $11,000 worth of merchandise in total. Here's another up-close look at the suspect. If you can identify him, contact Linwood Police or submit a tip to Crime Stoppers for a cash reward of up to $1,000. More than four decades after a Boeing employee was found murdered in her home, her accused killer is finally behind bars. Kent Police say he was identified by genetic genealogy from evidence left at the scene. I was there as the victim's family got the good news of an arrest from the detective who was determined to solve this case before he retires. It took a long time, but we did it. Yeah. More than nine years after Kent PD Sergeant Tim Ford reopened the 1980 cold case murder of 30-year-old Dottie Silzel, he shared the news of an arrest with her family, who had gathered at her gravesite in Renton. So, and know, we what? finally did it Tuesday. Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you. His long search for a killer took him to Clinton, Arkansas, where 65-year-old Kenneth Dwayne Cundert was living in a trailer on a 32-acre piece of land. Tim has definitely elevated the Kent Police Department very high. Dottie's sister-in-law, Carol Yonser, says word of the capture released more than 44 years of emotions. They all came flooding back. Her husband, Ken, Dottie's brother, remembers racing to his sister's condo after Kent Police found her nude body. Carol called me and says screaming something going on, and I had an old 55 Ford pickup. I must have did 100 miles an hour. Dottie was the youngest sister in the Yonser family of nine. She was single, lived alone, and worked as an instructor at Boeing. She volunteered for Special Olympics as a hugger for the athletes crossing the finish line. And there's a picture of her and a group of huggers that they were all great, happy to share those hugs with everyone in Special Olympics. Her niece, Leanne Milligan, idolized her. I remember when we were little kids, she would hand sew a whole box of Barbie doll clothes, shoebox full, and give them to all of her nieces, you know, when we were little. And I mean, she just, she was that kind of person. Yeah. Leanne was 20 when Dottie was killed and says the murder hurt her dad to the core. He died in 2016. In fact, the first thing that happened when we found out he'd been arrested is I just wanted to pick up the phone and call my dad. I just wanted to say, Dad, we got him. We got him. Cundert's arrest is only the first step in their tortured journey to find out exactly what happened and why. First it was outrage, and then it was just overwhelming joy that we get some closure and hopefully we can convict this guy of doing what he did. He's a monster. On the last night she was seen alive, Dottie left Gitano's Pizza, where she worked some nights to make extra money. It was only three blocks from her home. When she didn't show up at Boeing for the next two days, a family friend and a Kent PD officer went to her condo. They found the front door locked, the sliding back door forced open. Dottie was on the second floor in her sewing room, her robe wrapped around her left arm. The autopsy showed she'd been beaten in the head, sexually assaulted, and strangled. As the case stretched on without an arrest, her siblings wondered if it would ever get solved. People were doubtful. There's no way they're going to spend money for DNA. In 2015, then Detective Ford started organizing the evidence as DNA technology started to bring new leads on old homicides. A year later, the State Patrol Crime Lab used a semen sample from Dottie's robe to obtain a profile for the killer. But when they ran it through the National CODIS database of known criminals, no match was found. Then in 2022, a forensic genealogist at Identifinders International in California located ancestry matches for 11 potential suspects. By 2023, she had narrowed the list down to Kenneth Cundert and his brother. Kenneth refused to let his DNA be tested. His brother, though, volunteered a sample and was cleared. Detectives learned both were working in Washington State in 1980, but they found no connection between Cundert and Dottie. Then they discovered his brother lived in an apartment just 1,200 feet from Dottie's front door. On March 22nd this year, detectives flew to Arkansas. Court documents detail what happened next. They followed Cundert's pickup truck and saw him holding an all-white cigarette in his left hand as it hung out of a driver's door window. When he got out of the truck, he dropped the cigarette butt in a receptacle outside a Walmart store. There were only three all-white butts inside. All were tested, and from one of them, 
the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab obtained a DNA profile that matched the suspect in Dottie's case. To the people who, in other cases, have killed someone and assume they've gotten away with it, you should be nervous about every knock on the door because it doesn't matter how many years it has been, that knock is coming for you at some point. This is a picture of Dottie with her, with mom and dad Yonser in, in our backyard. The word justice means to make right. 44 and a half years after Dottie was taken from her family in the most horrific way possible, she's bringing them together, grateful for the tenacity it took to get here. Tim, thank you for all those hours behind the scenes. And making plans to all be there when Kenneth Cundert finally has his day in court. Prosecutors have charged him with murder in the first degree. DNA does tell at least the last part of the story. Where it goes from here, we don't know. But yeah. we do know that we all feel gratitude. Sergeant Ford is quick to point out that he's just one of many detectives that worked on this case at the Kent Police Department. Condert is awaiting extradition back here to Washington State. It was an horrific crime in Seattle's Madison Valley neighborhood. An 80-year-old woman and her dog killed during a carjacking. 48-year-old Jamed Haynes is now facing murder, assault, and animal cruelty charges. He's accused of pushing Ruth Dalton from her car, running her over, and then later stabbing her dog to death. Dalton was a dog walker, and her car was full of dogs when she was carjacked. Well, a plumber who witnessed that carjacking jumped into action with a baseball bat in hand. Spotlight's Jennifer Dowling spoke with that hero about his efforts to help the victim. It was an incident that should not have happened. Plumber Damon it's... Kohler is the hero that stepped in to try to save Ruth Dalton, the professional dog walker that died after police say Jamed Haynes stole her car and ran over her with her own vehicle. When things happen like that, you put yourself in a perspective that you can't help but be personally involved. Kohler was on his way to a job site and threw his plumbing van into park after he saw Dalton and the dogs being attacked in her blue SUV, and he jumped out to help. As disconnected as we all feel, we are all very connected. And if you don't lose that, it's amazing what you can do for your fellow person. Court documents state Haynes had a pocket knife in his hand, and witnesses like Kohler saw the SUV reversing with Dalton hanging out of the driver's side of the vehicle. Kohler says Haynes took a swipe at him with the knife as he tried to help Ruth. He then ran to grab a bat in his van and slid over the hood, swinging at the SUV, smashing out the back window and freeing some of the dogs inside. I would hope anybody would do it be 100% honest. During the struggle, Haynes was accused of backing over Dalton in autopsy stating she had crushing injuries to her torso. Court documents indicate the SUV struck two different vehicles as well before driving away southbound. Police believe Haynes then drove about 20 minutes south to Brighton Playfield where he killed Dalton's dog. Documents state an animal control officer found what appeared to be blood, fur, and or hair and bone present around a recycling bin that appeared consistent with a dog having been killed at that location. The dog was soon found with blunt force injuries and multiple stab-like wounds. A witness told police they'd seen a man near the bin with a prosthetic leg. We do not have a clothing description today, just that he was wearing pants. He does have a prosthetic leg. He has two large cuts on his hand, uh, left hand, and it's swollen. Police later ran prints on that bin, identifying Haynes, leading to an arrest. Kohler says the company that he runs now, he inherited from a man that had cancer. The bat belonged to the van's former owner, and Kohler had just kept yes, it, it in there. In my, it was in my vehicle, and there's, there's a reason it was in there, obviously. Things happen in mysterious ways. Kohler's modest about the role he played in helping to get justice for Dalton. Do you feel like a hero? Not at all. Not at all. Like I said, I hope anybody would have done the exact same thing I did. For the Spotlight, I'm Jennifer Dowling. A judge denied bail for Haynes. He has eight prior felonies on his record, and this is not the first time he's killed someone. He was convicted of vehicular homicide back in 1993. A 16-year-old accused of murdering a girl in a mall food court is trying to get his bail reduced, while the victim's mother pushes for change in the juvenile justice system. 13-year-old Jada Woods Johnson was shot to death in the Alderwood Mall back on July 3rd. She was an innocent bystander to a fight between two other teens. 16-year-old Samuel Gazaw, charged with her murder, was back in court on Monday. Jada's family has started a petition calling for Jada's law. It includes a no bail, no release policy for juveniles charged with crimes like murder, tougher penalties, and adult charges for teens who illegally possess a firearm. 
It also calls for the parents and guardians of those juvenile offenders to be held financially accountable. These teens are committing these crimes and getting off so easily with just a slap on the wrist. Um, at some point, these parents have to be held accountable. Jada's family has collected more than 4,000 signatures so far on a change.org petition. They plan to make a big push for a ballot measure. Meanwhile, Samuel Gazaw has a bail hearing set for September 4th as Jada's family urges the judge not to release him. When burglars strike in the dead of night, businesses can take a big hit just based on the damage done to their buildings. That was the case in a botched burglary in Seattle's Green Lake neighborhood. Take a look. This is what happened at the storefront of a Bartell Drugs on the morning of August 22nd. Police say two people used a vehicle to rip the security gate off the side of the building. Then they tried to yank out the store's safe with a chain. The massive metal box made it as far as the sidewalk before the would-be burglars bailed. Police say the suspects took off in a dump truck and a dark-colored SUV, hitting 14 parked cars on their way out. A stunning act of vandalism derailed an environmental project in Kitsap County. Someone fired up construction equipment and then rammed them into each other. Heavy machinery tossed around like bumper cars at this construction site in Silverdale. The vandal destroyed all the progress on a culvert for a fist passage near Newberry Hill Road and Sesame Street. It's a $4 million project, and this crime will put completion back several weeks. We are looking at damage to... Um equipment about a, uh, about a million to a million and a half dollars and we're looking at additional construction cost of between half a million and a million dollars it's just blatant vandalism it's not an accident you know we're used to people stealing diesel you know breaking a window but this is brutal vandalism and it is heartbreaking Investigators believe the vandalism happened late at night on August 22nd. They say the person responsible tried to light the equipment on fire but failed. If you have any information about this case, please contact the Kitsap County Sheriff's Office. When it comes to chasing down suspects, four legs are better than two. Canine units are a crucial part of law enforcement, and we have some body cam video that demonstrates just how effective they can be. Here's Pierce County Sergeant Darren Moss with a well-earned shout-out to Canine Eddie. At 12.09 p.m. on Thursday, August 15th, our deputies responded to a call of an armed robbery at the SARS market at 133rd and Pacific Avenue. Two male suspects were attempting to steal alcohol, and when confronted, they pulled out bear spray and sprayed employees as well as bystanders. They then fled in a maroon Honda sedan. Do you still have the white shirt on underneath? No? Shoot. Okay. Let me... Yeah, I'm going to take pictures of it. I got it. I'll grab it. Our canine deputy heard the call and the vehicle description and started checking for the vehicle on Steel Street near Highway 512. He located the vehicle driving north and confirmed the plates matched. When he made a U-turn, the armed robbery suspects took off. They crashed at an apartment complex and decided to run on foot, probably not realizing that canine Eddie was the deputy they had to outrun. Got, got two running here at the apartments here. Please stop! I'll send the dog! You better stop! You're gonna get bit! Here, buddy. Get that guy! Get that guy! Get that guy! Get that guy! Stop kicking one of them. I'm sorry! Stay there, right there. You got it? I got it! I'm not sure where the other guy is in the county. Keep your hands behind your back right now. Dude, I, I cannot put, I can't put my handcuffs on you because okay. I got my dog. Okay. Got it? I got it. <laughs> now the suspect was caught, but he had to listen to Eddie talk smack until backup arrived to handcuff him. Unfortunately, Eddie couldn't track the second suspect because we didn't have a good starting point and there were a lot of people around. Thankfully, a citizen pointed out the second suspect who was trying to hide under the stairs. Put your hands up. Put them up on there. Right here. Perfect. Here. Perfect. Here. Perfect. Here. Perfect. Here. Perfect. Here. Perfect. Here. 
Yeah. You're taking his second in custody. That's 100% him. I saw that. That's all. I get his shirt's right there. This was a great arrest of these two armed robbery suspects who just so happened to be father and son. But there is a sad side to this whole story, and that's the fact that this was K-9 Eddie's last call. K-9 Eddie's partner has been promoted to sergeant, and therefore, right after this, Eddie had to hang up his badge. K-9 Eddie, your partner, your department, and your community, thank you for your service. <laughs> oh, Eddie, we will miss you talking smack to these suspects and all the captures you've had. Enjoy your retirement and good job. That does it for us tonight on The Spotlight. Until next week, I'm David Rose. Please stay safe.